pretty stiff tomorrow, even if you just do one. Um, but if you do two, you're really on, on route. So you're going to stand up. You're going to find about an arm's width from your neighbor here so we don't punch anybody. This four-minute workout is something that can revolutionize corporations as well as communities because it improves human neurologic function and improves vascular function. It literally reverses the aging process at the cellular level. We're going to release the nitric oxide from 16 of our largest muscle groups, and it's going to have a huge effect on our biology. So we're going to just do start with squats. We're going to do 10 of these squats. A squat is where your butt's going back, kind of like you're going to go sit into that chair, and then you're going to stand back up. And we're going to do this fast because we need to run out of oxygen, all right? Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then we're going to do this. We're going to swing the arms 90 degrees right down to your side right here and then straight up. This is kind of like the old Tin Man Soldier. We call this the Tin Man March here. So you got a 90 degree swing. We're going to 10 on each arm. We'll call that 8, 9, and 10. Then we're going to do a big swing. Click at the top and then click right down in front of your pelvis. So it's a full 360 degree circle you're making here. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The speed is important because we want to run out of oxygen at the muscle groups. This is just 10 straight over the head. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Back to the squats. One, two. The cool thing is you don't have to change. You don't need weights. You can do this as soon as you jump off a tractor. Do a quick set. Jump back on. 10. Straight back here to the 10 man. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Big circle. One, two, three. You're supposed to do 20 reps, but we're beginners here, so we'll just do 10, and we're going to go here, and then straight over the head. Five, six, seven. Isn't it weird how much your shoulders are hurting right now? Like, we've been working out for a minute and a half so far. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And then you're going to do this. And in this, in this four-minute workout, you're going to do more neurologic and biologic muscle building than you will in an hour of exercise in a gym. It's crazy. You stop there, and then we're going to do a big circle. Those shoulders, what the heck? Wow. Seriously, what's going on there? Like, I, I, I can't even do 10 of those? Here we go. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Woo, that's three sets. All right, so four-minute workout, Zach Bush. You can search that online, free 15-minute tutorial, and it'll take you through that. But if you do that two or three times a day, you will completely revolutionize your aging process. And so I make my staff do this. Bell goes off at 10 a.m., bell goes off at 2 p.m. It improves the, ph the physiologic output of my staff, improves our company output because their neurologic system is generating fuel across the system. All right, three, two or three times a day, you're going to knock it out of the park. When we, do, when we follow people with uh, heart rate variability, which is one of the be best measures of longevity, you can reverse the aging process 30 years in three months by doing that twice a day. 30 years of biologic damage reversed in three months with enough nitric oxide back into the system. The Nobel laureate got uh, the Nobel Prize for finding that nitric oxide could reverse cardiovascular disease. And so this is one of the most powerful healing compounds on the planet of the Earth. I just gave you a free mechanism to release that all the time. And the amazing thing is almost none of you will do it. <laughs> and so it really makes me wonder where this gray matter has chosen to spend its time. Certainly not in self-care. It's mostly spending its time in self-abuse. We create doubts, we create insecurities, we create fear, we create guilt, all up in this brain, and it keeps us doing things that we think are important when, in fact, we're missing the boat on life itself. So the next hour, we're going to look at just how far we are from understanding life on Earth and what we've done in our disconnect from that biologic life. First world epidemics are, I face every day in my clinic, but I want you guys to get a, get a sense of this because you don't necessarily get exposed enough unless you just sat through my 8 a.m. lecture this morning. There's a lot of you who are glutton for punishment back here again for more. Can't figure out why. But I'll try to give you some different perspectives perhaps in this hour than we did this morning in case you're on your second round. This is a look at the trajectory of chronic disease in the United States. Extraordinary numbers. Autism now affecting one in 30 kids. 
well, attention deficit, uh, the more mild version of autism, here at 1 in 10 children. Keep in mind, these are the ones that have been formally diagnosed by their physician. We think that we're missing two out of three children in both of these categories that don't have access to good health care, especially in the inner city environments and especially for our minorities. And it turns out that the, the African Americans have somewhere around 500 to 800 percent more autism than their, their Caucasian counterparts and, and are uh, less diagnosed. So we probably really are only seeing the tip of the, the crisis here. If you go into any elementary school classroom today, you don't need a physician to tell you we have a problem. You will see kids with attention deficit and on the autism spectrum in every single classroom now in that school. Asthma, our children cannot breathe. In the United States, we've diagnosed one in 10 children, but we don't even screen for this condition. So again, we're missing most of this. In Australia, they universally screen for, for asthma, and they know that their children have one in four with, with asthma. One in four children cannot breathe. Profound that we have created a biologic environment where our kids are failing at this rate of just simple biology of breath. Diabetes now affecting one in four adults over the age of 25. One in three now with obesity. Major depression now at prevalence of one in two. In the 1950s and 60s, this prevalence was one in 100 with major depression. We're going to look at how that's happened today. And we gave you a clue yesterday in, in that short talk of what's happening to the microbiology and why that's affecting our risk of major depression. Cancer, I don't know if you heard the news a few years back, but we hit one in two American adult males with cancer before they die. 50% of males will get cancer now before they die. Women are just behind at one in three. We'll take a look at it in a second at the trajectory of that. Dementia, though, take a look at that population statistic. You don't see one in one very often. That means that 100% of us have an, a form of dementia. This study was done out of the University of Virginia when I was there in 2002. And what we found, even as far back as 2002, which, again, 18 years progression, I can guarantee you these numbers would be worse, but you can't get worse than 100%. 100% is 100%. But what does happen is the age at which this happens gets younger. In 2002, we found that by age 28, 100% of the people in this study had early signs of dementia. They were having problems doing short-term to long-term memory programming. Most of you look younger than 28, which is great, but you're speeding towards this brink of inability to maintain it. And you might just ask your spouse, if you really want to know the truth, how is my short-term memory doing? And your spouse, in their beautiful honesty, will say, it's terrible. I've told you four times to get this thing from the grocery store, and you haven't done it once. You know, and so we literally, people are telling us information, and we can't keep it there. And we justify, well, social media is distracting me, and somebody texted me. And we come up with all of these rationales to why we can't remember things. But the fact is, the human brain literally is losing its capacity to switch short-term memory into long-term memory. This is the trajectory now for these diseases. The harbinger is really autism. One in 5,000 children in 1975 diagnosed with autism. By 2010, we saw one in 110 children with autism. We knew we had an epidemic at this point, or at least some of us thought we did. But there was a large contingent of physicians who kept saying, well, maybe we're just recognizing this condition better than we did back in 1975. And therefore, we're not really an epidemic. We just now know the condition. Well, Spending 17 years in academic halls of medicine, I can tell you that I would not be at all surprised if the doctors had no clue in 1975, because today they still have no clue and continue to miss this diagnosis over and over again. But I'll tell you who I do not think missed this in 1975, and that was mothers. There is not a single mom in the history of the United States who failed to recognize that their kids suddenly, between 18 months and two years of age, suddenly lost all verbal skills, suddenly lost motor control, and started hitting their head against their crib for four or five hours a day in unconsolable tears. That's the typical experience of an autistic parent that then faces the next 25, 30 years to try to rehab their child through this overwhelming sensory overload that that child has every single day. There's no mom in 1975 who missed that. It's impossible that we missed autism in 1975, but that was the argument. But the argument started to fall apart because over the next three years, we doubled our rates. And we have now doubled our rates every three years for the last 10 years. 
We're now at about one in 30 children with autism, and we are on trajectory to hit one in three children in the United States with an autism spectrum disorder by 2035, 15 years out. One in three children with autism is a spectacular crisis from a healthcare standpoint, but from the financial standpoint for a nation, it is the end of an empire. We simply cannot generate the economy that requires a United States kind of behavior with one in three children with autism. Physically impossible for us to generate enough money to take care of that. We're seeing with autism, especially the severely effect, affected autism, it doesn't just take out mom and dad's protect, productivity, it takes out their grandparents and often aunts and uncles. It takes three to four adults to pool their energy to take care of one severely affected autistic child. We don't have mechanisms that are good at stepping alongside those families and taking care of them in Western medicine. It really falls heavily on the family. So now you have seniors who are giving up their retirement, selling their homes to support their grandchild's health care with their autism. The only people that are making any monetary gain out of that is the pharmaceutical companies and the hospital systems. This is the trajectory for cancer in a shorter period of time, and I picked this period of time because it's what we measure one generation by. Between 1990 and 2015, in a short 25-year span, we doubled the rates of cancer. And you can see that the trajectory, like autism, is steepening. That is a bad news when you start to project this out to 2035. 20 years later here, and 20 years later here, we end up with one in three children with autism and 80% of the adults in the United States with cancer. There's no economy that can support it. And this is not theoretical. This is not like, this might happen. This is happening. This is the trajectory we're on. But it's not inevitable. And I'm here to share with you today that there is a pathway out of this, and it has to do with farming. If it was just chronic disease facing us, we could perhaps engineer a thought process or a pharmaceutical industry to trick our ways through that. But the problem is much darker than that. It's that we can't even reproduce as a species. Just over this short period of time, this 1970 to 2010, and for those of you in, who were alive in 1970, think through what's happened in those 40 years. 40 years is a very short amount of time. I certainly didn't think that when I was 16. I thought my parents were old as dirt when they were 40. And my parents look at me and they think I'm completely lost over the hills. Like, I'm so old. When, and so in a youthful mind, age is, is relative. But when you've lived for 50 years, and when I look back on my lifetime and see my kids now in their 20s, I watch them and I look at my own life and realized so little has really changed in 40 years. We say, oh yeah, well there's cell phones and everything else, but in reality, we are still driving, by and large, fossil fuel driven cars to and from work, and we work for 40 hours a week and we go home and we can still barely pay the bills just as we did in 1970. And so it's interesting that how little has really changed, but what has dramatically changed is our biologic function within that society that we've created. This is sperm counts, not just in the United States, but all Western countries. There's been a 52% decline in sperm counts since 1970 to 2010. Keep in mind, this doesn't look from 2010 to 2020, in which the case there's been a bit of an acceleration uh, by current numbers. But just over that 40-year period, there was a linear decline that was basically a, a perfect asymptote. to, you know, you had this straight down kind of curve here going. And you notice it's not slowing down. In fact, if anything, it's starting to speed up. And with this decline, we now have one in three males infertile by sperm count in not just the United States, but all Western nations. One in three males cannot bear children for a low sperm count. At this current trajectory by that same 2035 where we face you know, one in three children with autism, 80% of adults, and 60% of adults unable to reproduce. So we are now decades, just simple decades, current estimates around 70 years out from the extinction of our species, which is an extraordinary, mind-bending reality. It is bizarre in some ways that we have the human capacity, we have the, the neurologic, intellectual capacity to predict and understand our own destruction, our own extinction. I don't think that the animals that we are driving to extinction on a regular basis 
maybe realize exactly what's going on as they march into that ob oblivion. But we, we have the capacity to see this coming. And it was with some startled, extraordinary, kind of mind-bending experience again when I started working on farms a couple years ago. And the very first farm I set foot on, after two days with this farmer, he said, Zach, you know what? Current estimates in our farming industry is that we only have 60 harvests left on Earth. I got goosebumps all over. I couldn't believe the number was so similar to the 70 years that I understood for humanity. But it made total sense suddenly. And I suddenly realized I had been banging the drum out there, speaking all over the world, saying we have a human extinction event happening, to then change my talk two years ago to realize we have a biologic extinction process going on at Earth that is marching at exactly the same rate across all species. We're currently losing one species every 20 minutes to extinction. One species every 20 minutes. So in this hour together, we're going to lose three species to extinction, never to come back on Earth. That is extraordinary. That is such a fascinating thing. And it's happened five other times on Earth. Earth has been through five previous massive extinction events, losing 87 to 97 percent of the species on Earth in the, those extinction events. And every single time, what the fossil record shows us is that the extinction event happened due to a death of the topsoil, usually from an asteroid or a volcanic event that covered the Earth in a massive cloud of dust that settled in and choked out the topsoil. Interesting. Interesting that massive extinction happens over and over again with the death of the topsoil. And for the first time in, in the history of the planet, it's not an asteroid that hit. It was a species that hit. We are a destructive force on the planet. We are a consumptive force on the planet for topsoil. Fascinating journey. All of these numbers came home to me hard when I went to MD Anderson late, earlier in 2019, invited down there. And I had been lecturing on child disease for a lot of years, but it didn't really strike me the reality of it until I walked the halls. Because this is Texas Children's Hospital. This is Texas Children's Hospital, Texas Children's Hospital, two more towers behind these. This is Texas Children's Hospital, Texas Children's Hospital, and these are the planned towers that they're, they're uh, going to be under construction on back there because Texas Children's Hospital can't hold all the kids with cancer. Walking those halls and seeing these children was an extraordinary face on the epidemics that I've been lecturing on for so long. And it kind of brought it all home to me that this is not some public health statistic event. This is literally the faces of our own children who are walking the halls with chemotherapy hanging on those poles that has not changed in over 40 years. The same chemotherapy is hanging on those poles. We are failing as a science community to innovate cancer therapy as a, as a whole. There's a few little glimmers of hope here and there, but there's no pipeline. Nobody's saying we're going to cure cancer anymore. Every few years, some biotech company says, hey, we have the cure for cancer, and it fails. Because cancer is not a disease process. As a former chemotherapy developer, as I am, if you'd met me 12 years ago, I would have known nothing that I just told you about. And I was steadily working in my lab to develop new chemotherapies. And I was working with vitamin A compounds and some cool stuff. And my research ended up getting shut down by the pharmaceutical industry. And so it was my aha moment that there isn't innovation encouraged in this space. We aren't really looking for a cure for cancer. We're looking for more expensive management tools to treat and manage this disease process that we call cancer. But in fact, as I back out of that experience and over the last 10 years have come to understand biology in my clinics, I realized cancer, just like the snot in your nose when you get a cold, is a symptom not the cause of a disease process. We now know in my clinic that you have to be dehydrated to about 30% of your total body's capacity to hold water for you to get cancer. If you are hydrated, you do not get cancer. That's interesting. Is it that simple to prevent and cure cancer? And I would argue it is. A cell that's capable of bringing in enough electrolyte and ele electrical energy into itself and generating that electrical energy such that it would draw water into itself, it has so much information and so much productivity that it cannot become a cancer cell. And so when we see these children walking the halls, we're seeing the symptom 
of a collapse of biology at the simple process of moving nutrients and water into cells. We can try to treat their cancer all day long, but if we don't change their underlying biology, we will never really help them cure. We will really never end this epidemic of cancer in children and adults. 4% of the entire U.S. had a chronic disease in 1960. Today, 52% of children have a chronic disease or disorder in the United States. Look at that trajectory. It's mind-boggling that we've allowed this to happen. How did it happen? If we back up far enough and, and look at biology as a whole, as a planet, we get back to these native prairies that dominated the, the entire planet. This was North America for sure, South America, with the exception of maybe the Amazon itself being dominated by trees, not grasslands. It was certainly most of Africa. It was certainly most of Asia and Russia. It was just this massive swath of grasslands that covered the planet. And as you know, as farmers, native grasslands had root systems that extend down 6 to 20 feet of depth with their species uh, variations in the hundreds. And so just extraordinary biologic life. And in an agricultural technical world that we live in, we've taught farmers to do this to their land. And what you see just in a typical picture, this one was snapped just in, in uh, uh, the Midwest at, on one of our, our trips. And you can see the, the, the damage done. So obviously, we've gone from 100% coverage of soil and root system mass over 100% of the, that, that planet to you know, maybe 10% of the actual surface area covered in a plant. And those bare rows between them have some, some really fundamental things that, that appear. The cracked, dried earth that you're looking at right there is the exact same symptom or underlying process to cancer in a human being. It is the inability of that soil to bring water in and maintain water within the soil structure. That, I'm telling you, is the biology of cancer in a human being. It's happening on the soil itself. When you get that dried and cracked soil uh, turning into dirt rather than soil systems, you get silting. So if you can see in this row here, you've got this trough that's been, been formed by water that's collecting in that, that row. And the water is not sinking into the soil. Instead, it's, it's standing in these little troughs as the silting of the, of the, the fine so dirt uh, gets, uh, clogs all the pores in the respiratory system of that soil. Yeah, actually, good point. He's saying compaction for the driving roads. And you can see a compaction here. So here's a tire track running up that one right there. So now you have a compression of that dead dirt and system there. Yep, you're exactly right. So you can see the compression left a, a water, uh, water pool here, water pool here, and a fresh track there, every other row. And so fascinating. If you look back over civilization, this gives me just goosebumps every time I think about this. But if you pick up any Western civilization textbook, in chapter one, in the first paragraph, it will say that Western civilization began at the invention of the plow. Whoa. 900 AD, we invented the plow, and we claim that is the beginning of civilization. And in hindsight, it was the beginning of the end of Earth. Isn't that interesting? Western civilization, since its birth of the plow, has been against Mother Nature. That's pretty fascinating. And so when we talk about no-till agriculture, we're talking about backing up 1,100 years in practice. That's why it's so hard to change the mind of a farmer. There's 1,100 years of generational memory that you are supposed to plow. And at that moment, we disrupted Mother Nature's lungs. We disrupted biology. We disrupted carbon cycles. We disrupted water cycles. And we began the collapse. And we've accelerated that, not in the last 1,100 years, but in the last three decades. The last 30 years, we've collapsed the system. It's bad in, during the growing season, but I think the worst situation we have through the Midwest in particular is wintertime. This is what the grasslands look like in wintertime. And during this de de decay of all of that biologic mass, the fungal systems go berserk with busyness. All winter long, collecting the nutrients that are being reabsorbed from the di dying biomass and redistributing those nutrients over hundreds, if not thousands, of acres for every mycelial bed. And so the mycelium are now redistributing all those nutrients so that there can be an explosive growth in the spring to bring all of the carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back into green life. This was the breath work of the planet. Now, when we travel the Midwest, this is your best kept farm. 
that's amazing. We've literally been told that to be a good farmer, you have to tear out every last semblance of life from that soil all winter long so that you have a clean farm. Landowners have come to believe that that's what their land should look like, and they expect their farm managers to produce that. When our farmers start to change regenerative, the first people to bitch is usually mom and dad. They're like, what are you doing, son? You're leaving all these weeds and mess all over the place. This place looks trashed. Because they stopped plowing and they started doing cover crops and leaving the cover crops on top to decay all winter, it looks like crap to the eye of somebody who thinks this is a clean farm. But it doesn't stop there, obviously. I spend a lot of time in agriculture now, and so I spend a lot of time in feedlots because my companies are developing products to bring nature back into these spaces. And what we, I find, you know, I can walk, you know, 100,000 acres of, of uh, land that's being done with high-intensity uh, feed uh, protein production, and I cannot find a single blade of grass in thousands of acres. It's just dust. And, of course, you get into the poultry industry, and it's just... There's nothing even remotely nature in that space. The, the swine uh, production in, in South Carolina out in my neck of the woods, it is horrific, the North Carolina, South Carolina, and West Virginia pork industry. These animals never see the light of day. They've only seen fluorescent lighting. They do not know what fresh air smells like. They do not know what the sun on their back look, feels like. They don't know what fresh dirt feels like under their feet. These animals are so torn out of their normal atmosphere that they are so diseased over the short course of their life that they have to be pumped full of medications and, and antibiotics and the rest. If, if you haven't been keeping up with the poultry industry currently, just in the last two years, we hit 30% loss of the flock before we can harvest them, which is amazing because they only live for six weeks. So within six weeks of birth, a third of those animals have died from invasive salmonella and E. coli. Holy it's impossible to live on a planet Earth that looks like this. And that's, of course, what we're turning the experience of a child into today. The experience of your typical elementary school child now has never walked on a farm, has never walked through a garden. Most of the kids that we work with in the cities in particular don't know what a carrot comes from, and don't actually know that a carrot grows in the ground. They don't actually know what a carrot looks like because they think it looks like a little finger that's got no skin on it whatsoever. They literally don't know what a normal carrot looks like. It really came home when we, ha we took a New York uh, city, city journalist with us uh, to one of our trips out into Pennsylvania, literally an hour drive from his home. And as we're approaching this farm, he grabbed the arm of our filmmaker and said, oh my god, is that a cow? This guy's lived for 28 years and has never seen a cow. He lives in New York City. He's just like minutes away from some of the most incredible farmland in the world. We are so isolated. We're creating this situation for human beings in which they will not touch nature. They wake up in a, a drywall box that off-gasses weird shit off the plastics of the carpets and their mattresses and everything else, and they get in a plastic off-gassing car drive to a building with artificial air that, with not a window that can open in the entire skyscraper, sit in that artificial air in off-gassing cubicles that fill their body with carcinogens. And then they get in, a, in there and they drive to a grocery store on their way home thinking that they're about to touch nature and it's being sprayed with E. coli infested water systems there so that it looks fresh and green. And they grab that thing and they go home and they the, interestingly, there was a big scare. My bro brother's in the military, special forces, blah, blah, blah. Now he works for the National Ground Intelligence Center. And there was a big scare for Homeland Security a few years back that they'd seen some threats on social media from the Middle East and everything else that, that maybe somebody was going to poison uh, the, the uh, uh, food at some of these large cafeterias and, and all of this. And, and so there was a big scare, scare of like maybe the next terrorism is going to be in, in buffets. And so the CDC rushed out, and the military rushes out, and they start doing all these studies. The conclusion of the study six months later is there is no terrorist on Earth that can make the food system more toxic than it currently is. <laughs> the bacteria that we're growing off of these buffets are the t bacteria that we are terrified of in a hospital. They were Pseudomonas, it was E. coli, it was Salmonella, it was Klebsiella, it was all of this horrible Clostridium. 
in the typical buffet sitting there out at these restaurants across America, we have created this artificial environment in mass. Soil degradation across the planet now looks like this. Very degraded soils in red and orange, the degraded soils. And the stable soils in this light tan. And you'll find out that the stable soils are only in places we can't reach. Massive deserts, Siberia, and the great tundra up there, and the tundra of Canada, the tundra off the sides of Greenland, the mountain ranges of the, the Andes, the mountain ranges down in Chile and Peru, the extreme deserts in Australia, but otherwise we've degraded everything. 97% of agricultural soils on the planet are now considered to be degraded or very degraded. And this is what we've created in the process. We have created the largest loss of topsoil, the biggest dust bowl that's ever been. We're now losing an estimated one to two tons of topsoil from every acre of America farmland every year. As a farmer, can you afford to bring two, two tons of, of topsoil for every acre that you own? The cost of that if you were to replace all of our losses just in the United States alone every year, would be 11% of our $17 trillion GDP would be spent in replacing that soil. We, of course, don't replace soil on farms. What do we do instead? 11% of that GDP, you know, somewhere around $1.7 trillion, is channeled to our chemical companies to give us the inputs that would replace the dying soil. And it turns out that it's almost exactly $1.7 trillion that the farming industry gets every year to replace those soils. Wow. The only system on Earth that's profiting from the destruction of biology is the pharmaceutical chemical companies. This is the dust storm that hit Phoenix at the end of 2018, and it didn't even make the national news. We see all these things about fires and tornadoes and hurricanes, everybody wants to talk about that. But somehow, this doesn't make the news. That dust cloud that hit Phoenix in the end of 2018 was a mile high. 5,000 foot pillar of dust blowing across the Arizona prairie to hit that city. Huge dust bowl happening. Water systems are amazing. Water systems are one of the, you know, this is literally the vascular system of the planet is the wa fresh water systems. And it's bizarrely similar to the pattern on a heart. If you look at a human, uh, human heart, the shape of the heart and the vascular supply to that heart follows almost exactly this map, which is the tributaries of the Mississippi River. At the end of the Mississippi River, you see the deposition of those thousands and thousands and millions of tons of farm waste that are being washed down into those rivers. And of course, with that are the toxins that we're taught to input and spray onto those dirts and soils. At the end of the, that river, now blown up, is Louisiana. The mouth of the Mississippi is right here. The red zone is uninhabitable by life. We've put millions of dollars of fisheries out of business because fish no longer live here. I want to show you what dead ocean looks like. This is the dead ocean at the end of the Mississippi River. The only thing that thrives there is algae that's good at extracting the last amounts of oxygen out of that and turning it into photosynthesis uh, activity. Living ocean here. You can't fish in this space. There is not life in that space. Amazingly, a year and a half ago, this happened in the Mississippi River itself. It was the first massive algae bloom to hit a freshwater system. And so we are seeing not just ocean, but freshwater systems destroyed by the imbalance that we're creating by farm waste going into these river systems. The big point here for the planet Earth and the destruction of these species that have happened five times before the great extinction events is that the topsoil dies. Starting in the mid-1990s, we started to see here Al Gore and others pounding on the drum that we were producing way too much fossil fuel. At the time, the estimates were that we were producing about nine gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. Today, we're producing about 40 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere every year. And we've been told that's why there's global warming. But I started preaching a couple years ago that that can't be the case. That can't be the cause of global warming because the ocean produces 90 gigatons of carbon every year. And the plants produce 60 gigatons. And the soil itself produces 60 gigatons. So we've got 210 gigatons of carbon being produced every year by nature. And it never had a problem 
getting that 210 gigatons back into the soil. Why? Because the soil can hold 2,300 gigatons just in the topsoil, and the deep soils can hold 10,000 gigatons. What happened for us to start to accumulate CO2 and methane in the atmosphere was not overproduction of CO2. It was the lack of breath of the planet. We literally killed the lungs of the planet by killing her topsoils, and it can no longer breathe the CO2 and methane out of that atmosphere back into her soils to turn it into the carbohydrates and fatty acids of the plants that would then fuel our bodies. We disrupted the carbon cycles, and that's why CO2 accumulates. CO2 is not a poison. CO2 is literally, if you've ever taken an organic chemistry class, it is the currency of life. CO2 is literally how we pass life to life to life. It is the secret of regeneration, and yet our government has damned it, and we're paying you know, taxes on CO2 now. It's idiocy. We're pretending like biology is the problem. And we are building huge economies, trillion dollar economies out of this carbon problem. So his point is that not only is the plant life exuding it, and not only is the ocean exuding it, it's bringing it back in. So you're exactly right. Mother Earth figured out how to do a respiratory cycle. Breathe it in, breathe it out. Breathe it in, breathe it out. The oceans, it turns out, can only take up a net uptake of two gigatons versus 2,300 gigatons. The emo deep oceans are in the 10,000 gigaton range. 40,000. Maybe 40,000. Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't even hesitate to believe that. It could be 100. You know, the, the point is, these systems and the deep systems are the, the, the entire carbon record of the planet's history, one and a half billion years old. And so the point that he gives here is important because it turns out that while soil is very easy to increase a net in increase in net uptake, we can pull in way more than we produce. The plants are a good example. They will breathe in twice as much CO2 as they put in out. They'll breathe in, breathe in 120 gigatons just through the tree life uh, versus their 60 gigatons. The soil, we haven't even really come to understand it. The soil is probably able to do in the, in the kind of 10x range, and I'll show you why I think that at the end. But, uh, but the point is the soil can take in way more than it can, but the oceans cannot. If you actually exceed this two gigatons extra of CO2 into the oceans, their pH changes. And it turns out that the big extinction events on the planet were through the acidification of the oceans. You kill topsoil, that's the problem. You lose 85% of life on Earth. But if the oceans acidify, then you'll lose 97% of life on Earth. And right now, we are acidifying the oceans because we've so killed the breath of the soil that our oceans are being forced to take up more CO2. And its symptom, or the way that we can see that, is through these algae blooms. The largest algae bloom in the recorded history just happened this summer in 2019. That, that uh, uh, bloom went from the Gulf of Mexico at the end of the Mississippi River to the west coast of Africa, a single algae bloom, all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. What it's doing is pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it into the ocean, which is good for the, the atmosphere. It's good for Al Gore's campaign, but it's really bad for the oceans and survival of the planet. And so what we're seeing now is pH shift across the planet. And we're seeing the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia with the, the farm damage done there. And we're seeing the bleaching of you know, oceans, uh, ocean corals across the, the world now. Subtle changes in pH will, will make victim those, those uh, uh, spaces around the coral reefs. And so this massive decimation is wiping out our ability to breathe in the oceans and the planet. If you haven't caught up over the last 10 years, the explosion of data that is around uh, the, the microbiome now is really you know, impossible to, to avoid. You pick any women's health journal up now, you'll see that there's some discussion on the microbiome happening even in those most cursory looks at human biology. We now understand that the human body is not limited to its colon or intestines or skin for which we find this soil-like activity of the microbiome. We now know that it actually involves every organ in the body. I mentioned to you yesterday that the, the human breast is full of bacteria. And if you change the terrain of that bacteria through exposure to antibiotics, you will get cancer. If you destroy uh, you know, if you make it sterile, you lose all the bacterial input, then the woman dies of metastatic breast cancer. 
And so we now know the prostate has a whole organic garden in it. We know that the kidneys and, and, and the urinary tract is full of a complex series of microbiome. We now know that the, whole, the human brain has its own microbiome. Viruses, fungi, and bacteria living in the human brain. That is so the antithesis of my education as a physician. We were taught that this was a sterile vessel that depended on our skin and immune system to keep all those bugs out. Now we find out that the first response system for healing is the microbiome. So if you take the brain of an, a woman with Alzheimer's dementia, which killed my grandmother and is now rapidly declining my mother-in-law, it's a horrible disease to watch a, an able-bodied person lose their mind. It's a horrible thing to see memory disappear. And I can tell you that we are doing that as a species. We are losing our collective memory. And so I think our behavior is hard to change because we can't remember from where we came. There's all this talk about paleo diets and going back you know, thousands of years into paleo history and eating like that. All we have to do, people, is go back to 1995 and eat like that. That's it. Like, we don't have to go back to some distant period to reverse all these chronic disease epidemics that are now hitting the planet. So it's fascinating how recent our memory has failed. Who remembers 1945 when we were growing 45% of our food system in backyard victory gardens? And we have to go back to 1945? 95 would be fine. How are we eating so well in 95? Because we hadn't yet done the following slides. <laughs> In 1995, something dramatic changed. And that was pretty recent. By my history, I was really, really cool in 1995. I was doing all kinds of cool things. I felt young and hip, and I loved the great bands, and I was grunge, and I was in a band, and I felt so cool. 1995 was a good year. I, it was actually, you know, I think correlated with, with, with uh, some of that grunge rock and roll maybe being the beginning of the end for, for humanity's health in some <laughs> weird way. Um, but uh, maybe it wasn't the flannels. I don't know what it was in the 1990s, but, but let's take a dive and see what we find. Antibiotics, you know, as I've told you, uh, kill bacteria, and, and I'm now trying to convince you that bacteria are critical for human brain function, human prostate, human breast, every single organ depending on its microbiome. If that's true, then we should see a huge correlation with the cancer death in the country and the antibiotic prescriptions from physicians. In the red, you see the highest death rates of cancer from 2007 to 2011, and our map stays this way today. And so this is our current death map, and you can see the states that are most affected by cancer death. I pulled this map from a New England Journal of Medicine article in 2013, showing the states in which we prescribe the most antibiotics. The numbers are pretty gross. This is 996 to 1,237 prescriptions for every 1,000 men, women, and children in that state. Per year. And so basically, one or 1.2 prescriptions of antibiotics for every human being in these states. That's a lot of prescriptions. It's a lot of money for the pharmaceutical industry. Turns out we prescribe 7 million pounds of antibiotics per year in the United States. 7 million pounds. It's gross. But how crazy is it that the state by state lines up so carefully to that antibiotic exposure? What was the last time that a doctor handed you a prescription for antibiotics for your bronchitis or your urinary tract infection, sinusitis, and said, by the way, you're probably going to die from cancer, but you'll feel better in a few days? Well, you're not aware of the devastation we're doing to the soil of human life when we hand somebody an antibiotic. We don't know. This is the antibiotic prescription rate in the United States. Look at how flat it's been. For the last two decades, we haven't changed the antibiotic prescription behavior of physicians because it turns out it's physically impossible to get more antibiotics into the human species through prescriptions. We're already exceeding one prescription for every human being in most of these states. And so it is an extraordinarily amazing thing that we have literally saturated the human capacity for antibiotic prescriptions in the United States. We can't prescribe more than we do. What has changed is that over the same course of time, over those two decades, we have, starting at almost at the same point, 7 million pounds a year to now 30 million pounds a year, put those antibiotics into our animals. And so now we're 5 to 1 pounds of antibiotics into beef, poultry, and 
swine as we are into the humans. What happens when you start eating food that has no microorganism foundation and is stressed and dying when you eat it? Very few species are, are, have the microbiome capable of being carrion, eating decaying flesh. But I believe that's what we are now doing in the typical meat industry is we are eating decaying flesh every time you get a chicken salad or a ham sandwich at a, at a restaurant or a grocery store. You're eating flesh that is dying and 30% of the flock is dead by the time that food is harvested. You're eating decaying flesh because it's been disconnected from its microbial foundation, from the soil from which was supposed to be birthed that gut of that chicken or that pig is now disappeared under the pressure of antibiotics. But is it really oral antibiotics that we're concerned about? And the answer is no, it's not. It's not the antibiotics being prescribed to the animals or this because 30 million pounds into our animals sounds like a lot. But there's something that happened in, in 1995 that was more insidious than just antibiotic prescriptions. This was the map of cancer death in the United States before 1995. 1970 and 1994 happens to be this data set, but it hadn't changed since the beginning of recording in the late 1800s. New England has always been our hot spot for cancer. The only cancer that adds the Northwest was prostate cancer. But lung cancer, you know, colon cancer, all of them have been New England, New England, New England. That, that has always been our, our epicenter until 1995 to 2007. And suddenly, in a heterogeneous population in an eight-year period, we actually flipped the map of cancer death in the United States to suddenly be the epicenter in the South. That should have made national news because it should have changed my industry. This had already happened by the time I was doing chemotherapy development, and I hadn't been told that the cancer map had flipped. To create this big of an injury in a diverse population of the United States, you have to do something about 10 times the size of Chernobyl. You have to do something that is so injurious to the environment and to human biology that it, to get that magnitude, you're 10 times Chernobyl. So between 1995 and 2005, we did something around the size of 10x Chernobyl. It took a while for me to kind of wrap my head around that because I was trying to, I was not working in, in animal or plant agriculture at the time. I was just working on soil science at the time that I was working on these maps. And then one of my colleagues told me about glyphosate and what he told me stopped me in my tracks. He didn't tell me about what it was exactly. He said, yeah, he's in Roundup. I was like, okay, interesting. I'd kind of heard about Roundup. I'd never heard of glyphosate before. And then he mentioned that it had been patented as an antibiotic. And I said, well, bird. wait, what? What did you just say? What is it? And so then I started looking into glyphosate and found that this active ingredient Roundup and now 97% of the herbicides on the planet being, remember China now makes most of the glyphosate in the planet because it came off patent in 2007. Uh, all five of the big chemical companies, Dow, 3M, they all make gly glyphosate and put it on the market. And so all this damning of Monsanto and all this that we love to do in the press these days, it's not Monsanto problem anymore. It is a global chemical industry problem that we have around glyphosate production. But this is the spraying maps that I found. 1992 is when we started spraying crops directly with Roundup. And that was four years before the advent of genetically modified Roundup resistant crops. So what crop did we start spraying in 1992? Anybody remember? Grain. Yeah, grains to desiccate. So no, Monsanto came up with a brilliant marketing plan. We're not going to sell this as just a weed killer. We're going to start to sell it as a drying agent. So they sold it as a desiccant to northern climate farmers so that they could kill the wheat before it would be harvested so they could get that harvest out of the ground quicker so that it wouldn't be destroyed by early frost or whatever they were dealing with. The, it turns out that very quickly the southern climate farmers figured out that if they desiccated the wheat early, they could actually get two crops every year out of the same soil if they put in enough inputs. So put in more chemical fertilizer, kill the, kill the wheat early, you can actually get two crops out of there. And so it was an interesting technique for accelerating grain production was desiccation. So that was 1992. In 19, in two, by 2011, we, we had genetically modified Roundup Ready organisms growing in every state, but obviously the vast majority in the Midwest and then the strip of California being obvious uh, addition to that. I was very disappointed when I found this map because I thought it was going to overlap perfectly with this death map of, of cancer in the United States that had flipped in the last eight, you know, 10 years since the debut of GMO Roundup-resistant res crops. 
And I thought I had maybe missed the point. It's certainly correlated. You know, there's like a rough co correlation. But I would have expected all the cancer to be up here. And then a few months later, working on another article, I found a, a, a map similar to this one, which showed me the tributaries of the Mississippi River. This huge pink blob in the middle is all of the tributaries of the Mississippi River. It's the largest water system in the United States. And if you now overlay that with that map, you realize you're collecting 85% of all the Roundup sprayed in an entire nation into one water system that ends in the last 90 miles between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. And it turns out that Baton Rouge to New Orleans is now called Cancer Alley. It's the highest rates of cancer in the entire world in the last 90 miles of the Mississippi because we are collecting an antibiotic from all over this country to the tune of about 300 million pounds of antibiotic into a single water system to deposit into the ocean. This is now the list of GMO Roundup resistant crops. Sweet peppers, tomatoes, of course wheat, but roses and petunias? Are you kidding me? Turns out that when I was invited to MD Anderson this past year to speak, I was not invited by the doctors. I was invited by their landscape crew. Their landscapers invited me down to MD Anderson because they had heard one of my lectures, the, the, the chief uh, engineer for their landscaping department had heard one of my lectures a couple years ago and had gone home in terror because he was responsible for starting what he thought was his legacy project at MD Anderson, which was every single day his crew grew and cut a rose for every hospital bed in their hospital. And then he realized that every day he was delivering a carcinogen into every room because their roses were genetically modified to be Roundup resistant and they were spraying them with Roundup and then taking those roses into those cancer patients' rooms. So he determined that he was gonna make it a Roundup free zone and the 600 acres of MD Anderson today are Roundup free. Not a single drop of glyphosate used across those 600 acres. That man has single-handedly made the biggest difference in cancer risk in that entire municipality that we call a cancer treatment center. He's the only prevention-minded person in the whole mix, as far as I can tell. It's extraordinary. And so I'm very, very impressed that those people that are working in the soil are seeing the truth and making active, easy decisions on how to change the truth for their territory, for their land. And they, they say, I can't deal with that huge problem of the Midwest, but damn it, this 600 acres is going to be clean. And that's the attitude that we all need to take on, is you can't control your neighbors today, but you will change your neighbors over the next 10 years when they see what happens when you do regen on a bigger level than you're currently doing it. When we go crazy with regen, it will become the way of the path for everybody, not because it's the right thing to do, but because it makes more money. It is way more profitable to grow a crop that requires no inputs. Farmers throughout the Midwest are going out of business for the cost of their inputs. They're losing 11% of our GDP every year and giving that back to the chemical companies so that they can grow a green plant and give all their money back to the bank that they borrowed the money from for their inputs. That's the current economy of the Midwest. Glyphosate usage worldwide, we just hit 2 billion kilograms of glyphosate annually. That's 4.5 billion pounds of a chemical. The United States only uses 300 million pounds, which is a disgusting number. It's 10x that of any other antibiotic usage in the country. It's gross, but 2 billion kilograms worldwide. The number one country in the world for glyphosate consumption right now is Brazil, and it's killing the Amazon jungle. The number two is Australia, and it's burning to the ground. You can follow the glyphosate spraying patterns through every country and see the decimation of ecology behind it. And then you watch the children get sick behind that. Australia, one in four children cannot breathe for, uh, for asthma. <coughs> Microbial dysbiosis and breast cancer, I showed you that slide. I'm going to cruise by because it turns out that the cancer patterns are not just limited to breast cancer explosion over that period of time. This is myeloid leukemia, explosive up across, starting in above that line in 1996. So that's 1996, that first, this is baseline up and down kind of over a couple decades, then suddenly 1996 jumps above any previous recorded history of le leukemia, most of this of course hitting children, and then you see the climb with the number of acres sprayed by glyphosate being in the, in the, 
in the orange line here and the blue line is the number of acres of, of uh, genetically modified corn and soybean. Same pattern here. This is now looking at urinary blood, uh, bladder cancer. And the reason I put that on there is because bladder cancer is the hallmark of toxicity in the environment. So anytime you see a Flint, Michigan type event where there's suddenly a toxin in the water and everybody gets sick, it's bladder cancer that tracks with that toxin exposure better than anything else. And you'll see that in 1996, we were at baseline, but within three years of that, we see us coming off a of baseline, 1999, and marching up. And so again, we don't have to go back to paleo times. You don't have to go back to World War II, 1945. If we went back to 1995, this huge epidemic of cancer and autism that I just showed you would be gone if we just went back to 1995. This is... Those are correlations, not causations. I mean, they're not proven causations. Perfect. So his point is those are just correlations, and the physicians have been screaming that. The CDC has been screaming that. So that's what my lab has been working on for the last seven years to show causation. And so I'll show you that in a second. This guy's always about five slides ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> The, he's keeping me honest. And the reason why he's faster than all of us is because for the majority of his life, there was no roundup in his brain. <laughs> I'm serious about that because I just presented a bunch of data to the EPA with a bunch of other scientists showing that the effects of roundup are generational. If you inject a mouse under the skin with a bubble of roundup, not enough to do any harm directly, you can follow that that mouse over the course of its lifespan, and there's no damage, no disease, no nothing, totally benign. And so Monsanto keeps saying, it doesn't cause cancer, it doesn't cause anything. The pups born to that animal, though, never exposed to Roundup directly, the pups all have diabetes and obesity and metabolic collapse and autoimmune conditions, second generation. The third generation, again, not directly exposed, but grandma now exposed, that third generation has early st stillbirth, can't, can't live from outside of the uterus, or has cancer, or has severe neurologic injury. Generational accumulation of the downstream epigenetic effects of a single exposure roundup. And so your, your generation, sir, is literally thinking clearer than the generations that will follow you based on your lifespan's exposure or epigenetic changes to an, an injury that only came towards the latter por portion of your maybe last 50 years of life. For that child who's born 50 years after the advent of this chemical is now not just dealing with the chemical toxicity of the Roundup it will see, it's actually seeing the epigenetic accumulation of that injury from its previous generations. The thing that terrifies me is we haven't yet birthed the third generation of children born into the glyphosate era. We're in our second generation right now. And that second generation has 52% of chronic disease by the time they're 18. The third generation, we don't even know what it looks like yet. We'll find out in 2035. Could be really, really sad situation that we've gotten ourselves into. This is, th I'm sorry they're off the screen here, but thyroid cancer, you get the point. Liver cancer, you get the point. But it's not just the cancers. Here's age-adjusted deaths from senile dementia skyrocketing. When? 1996, right in there. 1992 with the spraying of wheat, right in there. Here's hospital discharges for diagnosis of severe sleep disorder. Cruising along, suddenly 1992, 1995, 1996. By 1997, we're really in a, a vertical climb. Hasn't stopped. The brain stops working when it's exposed to an environment that is lacking micro, microbial diversity. So I showed you major depression, anxiety disorders, and sleep disorders, all dependent on the microbial diversity within the gut. So how does antibiotic function work in, in Roundup? This is from the, the Monsanto's own uh, data from their 1974 patents. Uh, they show that the, the way in which th this chemical disrupts biology is through bro blocking the shikimate pathway. And this is why they said that this was safer than water for humans. That was literally their tagline, Roundup, safer than water. So remember what they came into. They came to replace some very toxic chemicals. They came to replace with this Roundup compound things like uh, the, uh, the uh, chemical milieus that we were using then, which you know, are back on the market now, things like dicamba and, and all of these you know, variations, 2,4-D, which is Agent Orange, 
these were the chemicals that were already in play. Vietnam was, of course, you know, just a, a, you know, a, a playground for the chemical companies with Agent Orange. It, it was just a big herbicide. And we sprayed it all over the jungles, and we turned some of the most verdant jungles in the world into moonscapes. The entire Ho Chi Minh Trail through Cambodia and into Vietnam was literally turned into a dust, dusty moonscape, no living life left in it. And we did that through the same chemicals. And so uh, the advent of this seemed like it was going to be so exciting because it actually killed weeds better than anything on the market at the time. And actually today, all of our farmers say Liberty Link and all these other things on the market don't kill weeds as effectively as Roundup. And so Roundup remains an important tool in their toolbox. But the way in which it does it is, is interesting that the shikimate pathway only exists in bacteria, fungi, and plants. And so Monsanto just maybe honestly thought it wasn't going to hurt humans because we don't even have this enzyme pathway to be hit by the chemical. So we said, oh, it's going to be safer than water. And it can't possibly hurt human beings. How exciting. And so we put it into to everything. And to this day, Monsanto, when they're testifying at the EPA against me, they're telling again and again, it's the shikimate pathway. How could it possibly hurt humans? But what the EPA is not listening to is what the shikimate pathway does. It turns out this enzyme pathway that we don't have is where we're, the only place in nature that makes the aromatic amino acids which are what we call the essential amino acids because we can't make them, so we have to get them from our diet. What would happen if you sprayed an entire food system with a chemical that blocked the essential amino acid production in the food that we were supposed to get it from? It would mean that a woman birthing a child in her womb would be unable to knit that, the proteins together from those amino acids that that child would rely on for their health, for their immune system, for their function. And that's what we're doing today, is we are birthing children into an environment where they have, we have deleted uh, these critical letters from the alphabet that build the, the proteins. I have seven seconds left. That's not good news. Is there a 30-minute break right now? It's lunch. It's lunch. I, I'm going to let everybody go right now that wants to go. I'm not going to be offended at all if you just get up and walk out right now, because you should. And I, at this point, you should be thinking, this guy better be a quack, or else we're all going to die. <laughs> and so, yeah. But I want to give you some good news before you go to lunch, because nobody's going to want to touch their food if they go in right now. <laughs> and so I'm going to give you all the good news right now. It turns out this is a small intestine growing in our laboratory, and we've been trying to figure out how does glyphosate directly impact human biology directly? Because changing the amino acids and the proteins and changing fetuses, that's not fast enough to account for a cancer rate that doubled in a 25-year period. There has to be a direct carcinogenic factor in glyphosate, even though the chemical companies have sworn it doesn't exist. Then we found this almost immediately. So this is small intestine grown in our laboratory. You can see it's all laced together, zippered up with these green proteins that we're, we have glowing there with an antibody. Uh, to ZO1, which is the, the Velcro that holds all those cells into a cohesive blanket that protects your body from the outside world. Your gut is huge. It's two tennis courts in surface area. And it's made of billions of cells that function as one single membrane because of the intelligence of the connection between the cells. This, your, it turns out your vascular system is put together with the exact same Velcro. Your blood-brain barrier protected by the same Velcro proteins your kidneys that clear the toxin, same Velcro proteins. And so it turns out that if you take glyphosate at just 20 parts per million, which is commonly seen in 12 to 20 parts per million is what you'd see on a conventionally grown beet or turnip or sweet potato, any root vegetable, and you take that and you put that on the membrane, within 20 minutes the entire membrane has fallen apart. You've destroyed the Velcro such that it can no longer stick together, and now you have a gut that's in florid leak. So this is a leaky gut under the microscope. Turns out we can show the same thing with a root fibril system. The root fibers held together by tight junctions fall apart and start to leak as well. When you have a leaky gut, you can't actually pull nutrients effectively out of the food and you can't keep the toxins out. So you've lost your nutrient intelligence and you've lost your barrier system. Oh, uh, quickly, these are precancerous cells. So these are healthy cells here that are all attached. As they fall apart, you can see what happens. This is called the cytoplasmic to nuclear ratio. The volume of the cell shrinks by almost 70% within minutes. This is the hallmark of a precancer cell, is a high cytoplasmic to nuclear ratio. And so we are taking healthy small bowel cells and putting them in a precancer state in 16 minutes. In my research back in the day, I was told it takes 16 years for a, a, a human cell to do that shift. 16 minutes. 
The U.S. ranks now 35th in the world for health outcomes, but we should be able to treat all those diseases with our food because all the way back to Hippocrates, we've been told that food is your medicine. And in fact, he was right. There's over a thousand different alkaloid medicines that are now <laughs> identified in our food system. These treat things like parasitic disease, like Lyme disease that's gone rampant in our country over the last 10 years. Anti-asthma, one in four children can't breathe. Anti-cancer, one in two adults with cancer. Colon emetics that would, would prevent autism and attention deficit disorder. It's right in our food. Vasodilatory compounds like vincamine, right in our food to protect the hypertension and kidney disease. The antiarrhythmics that would keep us from dying from heart attacks. The analgesics that would treat our pain. All in our food, in the alkaloids, except that Roundup blocks the production of the alkaloids. And so not only did we delete the essential amino acids with Roundup era, our agriculture, we deleted the medicine from the food. Among these is vincristine. Vincristine, a famous alkaloid that is now sold for $28,000 a gram, is made in green plants that have not been exposed to herbicides, pesticides, and particularly Roundup. The pharmaceutical companies literally grow algae in large bins to extract the vincristine and sell it back to us at $28,000 a gram when it should have been in our food itself and always was. The pharmaceutical companies that sell the drugs that we take today own the chemical companies that spray these chemicals on our food. That should be illegal in my book. That is the definition of a monopoly, one that would take away a resource and then sell it back to the same population. That should be illegal. It's a great business plan, but it should not be legal. Probiotic use. We've been told that probiotics are going to save the planet because we're missing all this microbiome, but of course, a probiotic only has three species. Three species or seven species at the copies of billions a day, I've been preaching against this for years, is terrifying because it's exactly the same thing as what we've done to the Midwest. We covered the Midwest in corn, soybean, and alfalfa, maybe some wheat. We lost all the biodiversity, and then we took four species of bacteria where there should be 40,000 species of bacteria and created the probiotic industry. Believe it or not, we now sell $42 billion of probiotics a year. $42 billion of probiotics. And this is what probiotics do. This was published in Cell uh, in, in September of 2018. And they proved what I've been preaching for years. This is a, a mouse biome exposed to antibiotics for two weeks. It loses 80% of its microbiome diversity. Then randomized those mice to fecal transplant with their own feces that was collected before antibiotic exposure. They recover in about 25 days. Or put them on a probiotic in the green line. Probiotic, you see an effort towards recovery initially, but then with continued use of that probiotic, by 30 days, it has suppressed the microbiome at the same intensity that the antibiotic had. Planting a monoculture in your intestines is just as stupid as killing the bacteria themselves. Interestingly, they were required to give a placebo. And in the red line, you see that the placebo had already recovered half of its microbiome diversity throughout the latter half of the study. So they repeated it in humans, and this time they followed them for six months. And at six months, the probiotic harm still had not recovered their microbiome. If they did nothing and just took a placebo, at 30 days, they were back to normal. That is a $42 billion industry that should be replaced by nothing. <laughs> Interesting. Mother Earth is so great, graceful in her group. I've showed you that we fall apart at the membranes. We create cancer in 16 minutes from a chemical that we spray into the soils of Mother Earth at, at, at 2 billion kilograms a year. And yet, Mother Earth planned for this, apparently. And so it turns out that the bacteria and the fungi have left us an antidote to Roundup. And so in 2012, my world of nutrition, I had started a nutrition center in 2010, was teaching you know, the early science of the microbiome, and I was teaching how the bacteria convert all this food and carbon into fatty acids, sugar, and protein, that, uh, and micronutrients that allow us to live. But in 2012, a colleague brought in a soil science paper, and in that paper was this molecule. And it stopped me in my tracks and gave me goosebumps because it looked like the chemotherapy I used to make. So I had to ask, holy crap, how did the soil get that complex of a molecule sitting in there? And what is it doing there? If chemotherapy exists in the soil, not the plants, 
what does it mean for the bigger biology? And that's how I, as a physician, ended up being a soil scientist. We call them carbon snowflakes because every species of bacteria and fungi makes a different shape of this carbon molecule. And so every, every shape different. And when you put these into a liquid state in the abundance that a complex ecosystem of microbes would make, we get an extraordinary electrical event. We can actually change the oxygen-hydrogen bonding in the water state such that the entire system works to transmit electrons over large distances. We literally use this as a liquid circuit board for the human biology. So we plug the whole human biology in a petri dish or in a human in our clinic back into this liquid circuit board that passes information from one cell to the other. Keep in mind, this is not supposed to do and does not do anything directly to human biology. What it does is it amplifies the electrical passage of information from one cell to the next. And when cells stay in communication, they heal. Look at this, Mother Nature's grace. Control gut, blow it apart with glyphosate, give back the communication network of the microbiome that, by the way, we're extracting from soil that is 60 million years old. An antidote to Roundup was planted because the whole system zippers itself back together in minutes. This is something that I've never seen under a microscope before. This is literal three-dimensional multicellular healing happening in a sterile Petri dish. He, doctors have never seen this before. Scientists do not get to see healing happen. In Petri dishes, we can see disease happen and we can modify the course of disease, but you never see three-dimensional tissue repair happening in a sterile Petri dish detached from a body. The intelligence, the sheer intelligence that is reflected in the capacity to reverse the damage of Roundup boggles the scientific mind. Even more exciting, we show that if we give terahydrite before the glyphosate injury, the injury never happens. We've now taken this up to 20,000 times more Roundup than you would see in your typical diet, and there continues to be no damage to that membrane. Mother Nature literally planted in her soil 60 million years ago, which the reason we picked that, that fossil soil is because it's right before the 55 million year old extinction event that killed the dinosaurs and everything else, because the topsoil died at that moment. And we only had 55 million years to recover soil diversity between that extinction event and today. Well, it turns out the previous extinction period had been over 110 million years. So the complexity of biodiversity on planet Earth right before the dinosaurs went extinct was some double that of what we would have today. It had twice as long to recover and, and maintain the biodiversification of the Earth. And so we're going back 60 million years to recapture these carbon molecules that were made by that microbiome. We've exactly terahydrite. terahydrite is, is the, uh, the family, those million different variants of that carbon snowflake. It's the carbon snowflake derived from the, the soil. So we've published this in peer-reviewed papers and all that. Um, and this is you know, more science that I don't have time to go into, uh, but basically suffice it to say you guys have all heard of gluten sensitivity. We've now demonstrated that gluten sensitivity only happens if you spray the gluten with glyphosate. Glyphosate is the reason we created gluten sensitivity in 1992. Uh, and this is looking at celiac disease over the course of the 1990s. It was still almost undetectable until about 1993, 94, 95, 97, and then, of course, climbing since then. We created gluten sensitivity in celiac by adding Roundup to it, so we p published that. We've now gone beyond the gut to show that the blood-brain barrier collapses under, under the pressure of Roundup as well. So this is, uh, this is actually looking at the, the small intestine and the, and the blood-brain barrier. So this is intestine, this is blood-brain barrier. But if you give back that terahydrite, you get stronger than you've ever been before. You guys have heard of mitochondria. Again, we're running out. I'm about 10 minutes over time, so you guys feel free to take off. Um, this is looking at mitochondria and actin. Mitochondria is how carbon is switched into carbohydrates and carbohydrates into electrical energy. This is, this is where that event happens. So if you look at any biology textbook that's going to tell you about mitochondria, there's mi mitochondria, it will show you that there's two mitochondria in every cell. If there was two mitochondria in every human cell, we would never live. That's not enough energy for any single cell. It turns out this is what mitochondria look like in the cytoplasm of a cell. There are so many of them that there's no room for anything else. There are 200 mitochondria per human cell on average. But the human brain has 2,000 mitochondria per cell. We are energy intensive beings. Turns out that a cubic centimeter of mitochondria can produce 10,000 times more energy than a cubic centimeter of the sun. 
Let me repeat that. A cubic centimeter of mitochondria can make 10,000 times more electrical energy than the surface of the sun. Cubic centimeter by cubic centimeter. We are light beings, people. We glow. And it turns out that we have a camera and clinic developed by a group of physicists in Russia that shows us the glow. And that's my main diagnostic tool. Every single patient coming to my clinic now, I image them with this, this camera, and we can see where they're missing glow, where their lights are shutting down, which organ systems are failing. Before there's ever any evidence in the bloodstream that the liver is failing, we can show that the energy is collapsing in these spaces. What's happening is that the mitochondria are producing an enormous amount of energy out of carbon, converting fat, long chain fatty acids or carbohydrates, long carbon strings, into single CO2. And in that process, they liberate an enormous amount of electrical energy. To do that, they rely on their three dimensional structure that relies on these proteins that hold it in these exquisite curves, looks like the inside of a stomach or something here, those curves are created by the interaction of these large, pro, uh, large tubules and their protein anchors to keep those curves created. And it turns out the main protein is actin. Look at how beautiful this is. This is real uh, cytoplasm of a cell. All these green glowing mitochondria, again, crammed full throughout the cytoplasm, being held in this incredible architecture by this intricate web of actin filaments. It turns out that glyphosate destroys actin. Here is a healthy active thing. You can see a bright red outline around every single cell. And then as soon as you expose the glyphosate, there's no more outline. Instead, the red is being drawn into the center of the cells as the actin is destroyed and recycled. Terahydrite, those molecules of the bacteria, protect that membrane. And even in the face of glyphosate, you actually see stronger message and signal in the actin production than you did before. Stronger, not weaker when the microbiome and its diversity is able to communicate across those planes. What is that electrical energy going into? I told you, you're a light being. The proof is, again, in the anatomy. This is an electron microscope image between human cells. This just, I electron this literally on a daily basis, and yet it still gives me goosebumps because it's so freaking amazing. This is two cells that are anchored next to each other here. And this is a cable of tiny tubules that look like a bicycle cable, you know, thousands of little strands of steel that become super strong when you put them all together. These connect one cytoplasm of the cell, one mitochondrial bed to another mitochondrial cytoplasmic cell. This big cable here, when we blow that up, is actually this. This is now at 30 nanometers, and so you're now at about 100 times smaller than a human hair. And yet, look at the perfect architecture of those tubes, lining up in a massive array of tubes that go from one cell to the next. At this level, you have to ask, what is the cell working so hard to passage to the other cell? And the answer is on the end of each tubule, when blown up, looks like this. This is a perfect aperture that you would see on the end of a camera lens. At the end of every single tubule between these cells, at a circumference 100 times smaller than a human hair, you have a perfect mechanical aperture that functions at the end of every one of those tubes. You're literally passing light energy, and the tubes are generating and deciding how much light to pass to the next cell. Cancer, I showed you, begins when you cut all of that away and you get an isolated cell. Cancer is an isolation event. It is a lonely cell that is no longer connected to the light force of your body, and it becomes a cancer cell that will kill you. I find that poetic. I find it beautiful. And it tells us something about sociopolitical behavior as well. Isolation kills. Reconnection heals. Our politics, our social structures, and certainly our schoolyards need to teach our children that every single cell, every single being on that playground is critical to the life and, and protection of the species. The kid who's cast out and bullied, we need to teach our children that that's the potential cancer cell among us. We need to heal that person and bring them back in before there are 16-year-olds walking in with a gun and shooting their, their neighbors, before there are a 65-year-old man climbing up a tower in Las Vegas to kill 300 strangers. 
The cancer cells among us are the isolated, lonely cells that no longer feel the light of human existence. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed ahead here to the big solutions and show you the potential of healing. When we take these same terahydrate molecules and put them into play in a different mix for soil, so we need a different carbon matrix than we use in the human biology here, but as we've worked on the soil, we've come up with a different compound. And we just finished our first uh, tomato trials this past uh, fall, harvested after a 100-day trial. Um, this is with uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizers, MPK, typical applications used on any farm in the country. And you can see that the root ball was about two to three times the size of the man's hand, pretty healthy. Cranked out three and a half pounds of tomatoes out of that fruit uh, by plant, by average. Um, so we were very excited about that. That's a pretty healthy crop. This is the root ball when you let carbon cycling take effect. It's larger than the guy's entire torso. And this tomato plant, on the end of that root ball, produce 32 pounds of tomatoes. This is where I start to believe that soil can breathe in 10x the CO2 that it puts out. If we can 10x the yield of tomatoes by just doing better carbon cycling, it suggests that we've been missing the potential for biologic productive health on this planet because we weren't paying attention to carbon cycling. This is the, the, the way in which we get carbon into our patients, these carbon molecules. Um, IonBiome.com can get you a lot more of our published science on, on the effect on human biology. Um, but I want to show you this slide and take a picture of this. This is really the solutions for your family. Uh, it begins at vaginal birthing. During vaginal birth, you plant an organic garden into that child. Their nose, their throat, their mouth, their rectum, their entire skin, and the beginning of their gut is seeded with mom's vaginal flora, which is extremely diverse. And over the next six months of breastfeeding, her skin flora will further shift that microbiome to produce an intact immune system at six months of age. A child has no immune system that can relate to the outside world until six months of age. It's amazing that it doesn't die. No immune system in the mess of the bacteria and fungi that we have around us? I showed you we had five million species of fungi. How come they aren't killing every infant on the planet? Because the infant is supposed to be growing in that organic garden. There is no threat from the microbiome. The kid would be dead. He literally has no immune system, no innate immune system until six months of age. And over that time, it is informed by its increased exposure and seeding of mom's microbiome. Unfortunately, 32% of births in the United States is now done by C-section, a sterile delivery into the microflora of the hospital. What if the kid doesn't inherit mom, but inherits the hospital microbiome? That kid is now going to have invasive ear infections by the time they're six months of age. It's going to have pharyngitis by nine months of age. It's going to be on repeated courses of antibiotics to further denude and, and simplify its stuff by the time it's one years old. That kid now has no hope of normal biology unless we stop that and we put that kid out in nature. Surround it with a bunch of puppy dogs. Puppy dogs are really good at getting kids' microflora back. Why? Because dogs run around sniffing each other's butts all the time. <laughs> and then it's somehow socially acceptable to allow that animal to go jump up in your kid's face and lick their face. Fecal transplant every minute from your dog. And we've shown that that has huge impact on human biology. Turns out that the dog microbiome is very similar to the human microbiome in exciting ways. And so my cancer patients have to get a dog. I make them all get dogs, or they have to be outdoors. And for many of my cancer patients on chemotherapy and everything else are so weak and so decimated, their only connection with nature becomes their dog. And I make them get kind of a, a really annoying dog, you know, hole digger dog, you know, that just destroys the entire yard with holes. I want that dog digging in the soil and bringing that microbial diversity back to that patient. Unless they're spraying Roundup. This is interesting. Our nonprofit is working very hard on that topic because the third largest crop in the United States behind corn and soybean is lawn. 40 million acres of lawn grown in the United States under Roundup. And so we're working very hard. So we've got a whole, test, uh, a whole toolbox for homeowners, landscapers, city uh, uh, municipalities to get Roundup and, and herbicides out, and a whole toolkit of other things that they can use for, for pest and, and management instead. Uh, so that's on our Farmer's Footprint website. But I want you to go down that list quickly. The, one of the keys to getting bacterial diversity is breathe outdoors. Breathing your microbiome is critical. Grow your own food. It's extraordinary how few of the farmers we work with have grown food for their families. 
Most of them are eating Totino's frozen pizzas at the end of a long day of growing 10,000 acres of food. It, it, it defies logic, but it is the reality. Grow your own garden with your own hands. Touch the earth. I can't believe how many farmers I take out in fields who have not walked in a field in the last 10 years because they only drive them. When you have 10,000 acres in Midwest, there's not time to walk that. And so they literally haven't walked on their land. They've not stuck a shovel in soil in their entire career because they always did it with a plow. They always did it with the harvester. They never touched the soil. And so we're teaching farmers literally how to go out in their fields and dig 12 by 12 inch holes 12 inches deep to do earthworm counts. Of course, initially it's really easy because there is no earthworms, but then you know, over a six, 12 month period, you'll start to see the earthworm populations come back and we teach them how to count that. And, and it's funny to see farmers with shovels when they're like not really sure how to use them and stuff. It's, just like, it's kind of ironic situation. Stand barefoot in the grass and soil. It is unbelievable that in 1960s, we all went to rubber soled shoes and separated ourselves from the biggest anti-inflammatory in biology, which is Mother Earth. Turns out there's an electrical grid over the surface of the planet that delivers trillions of ions, electrical charge, into our body every time we touch the soil, and we stop doing it. So at the end of your workday, take off your work boots, and just for three to five minutes is all it takes is to stand barefoot on top of the grass or the soil. In that time, you will have the effect of thousands of milligrams of ibuprofen or other anti-inflammatories as that negative charge rushes in to neutralize the positive charge that is indicative of inflammation. Very cool stuff. So stand barefoot. Eat fermented foods every day. We got lazy in the 1950s with widespread refrigeration, and we went to refrigerator pickles instead of real pickled fermented foods. We've got to start fermenting our food again. It's a critical way to get microbiome diversity. Next, you've got to hug, kiss, and generally celebrate every human, animal, and plant that you can touch. A hug is a powerful way to swap information. I told you yesterday about microRNA. If you will please, each of you, please give at least three hugs to somebody you've never met before you leave this room. It's a beautiful practice. We now know neurologically the human brain only responds appropriately to serotonin and dopamine if you get seven hugs or better a day. With less than seven hugs a day, your serotonin and dopamine response is, is ineffective to the general life. We're not hugging each other enough. So hug each other big, love on each other, and let's change the world together. This is stuff you guys already know about, so I'm not going to go into how to do regenerative farming. But this is our nonprofit, Farmer's Footprint. Join us there. We would love to have you aboard. We've got a great 20-minute documentary you can share with your loved ones that kind of summarize a little bit of this information. Um, nowhere near the depth that you just experienced, but at least uh, be a starting point for education. We have a screening toolkit that's got written materials and questions and Q&A kind of stuff that you can do with your community. So have your friends, family over for an evening, have some neighbors over and just be like, let's discuss this. Let's just talk through this stuff and see what we might want to do as a community. We do have a toolkit for communities to, to ban Roundup and to do this. Huge municipalities are doing this. LA just banned Roundup. Miami County just banned Roundup. Why those two cities? Because they are taking the brunt of, of ocean water rise. Miami is underwater right now. That's not also in the news, just like the Dust Bowl is not in the news right now. But Miami is literally paving their streets a foot and a half higher to get them out of the water. That's stupid. It's costing them over $500 million to just repave the streets that are currently underwater. And they're only going three to four inches above the current water line. By the time they finish the project, the water's going to be above their new roads. And they know that. But that was all they could really get pushed through. And that's, they can't figure out how to get their streets higher than they are. So Miami is, is having to take some drastic measures. I want to thank my whole team. Everything that you heard brilliant out of my head to get it today probably didn't come from me. It came from one of these brilliant people that stand behind me. So I'm just the tip of the iceberg there. And so I appreciate your attention. Thank you for your participation. And more than anything, I want to point out that you showed up on purpose right now in human history. 200,000 years of Homo sapiens with maybe 70 years left and you showed up right now. With the complexity of human biology, you are a light being. I hope I have proved to you today, or at least opened up the possibility in your mind, too. If you are a light being that just showed up on purpose, then you are part of this solution. It turns out that as we start to understand regenerative medicine, it's not going to heal humanity. It's going to heal the planet. And you're right at the front lines as a farmer. Thank you for being here. <laughs>